I want to be very clear. Today's video is a bit of a hit piece. We're going to talk a little bit about the markets that I think are important, but a little bit of a hit piece video here, okay, on an individual in which um, this individual, you know, they, he, he, it's almost like it's illegal to try to bury this person. And I mean bury them. And the individual we're going to get into in this video is probably not the individual you're thinking. This individual is extremely famous in the stock market. They're so well respected. And I thought we would dig up a few things and um, just find a few things that I think are important to understand the angle that this individual is coming from, essentially. Okay, And I think not a lot of people know the truth behind this individual, and um, I want to expose the truth behind this individual so everybody's aware of that. And, you know, because he is, this individual is treated like a god. I want to be very clear about that. And, um, you know, it's just, it's the way it is, okay? And so we're going to get into that in this video, and I think it's very important. The NASDAQ is now up a roughly 24% from the bottom. It has made an absolutely epic, I mean, absolutely epic move. And, um, you know, when when, it was, when the NASDAQ makes a move like that, you would think, you would usually expect the overall feeling in the stock market to be extremely bullish and FOMO type feeling in the market and just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? You know, on the, on the, I don't feel it at all. I don't feel it at all. I, you know, if I ever watch CNBC, most of the people that go on CNBC, very cautious or bearish very few are super bullish, like the Tom Lee type people that are super bullish and like believe we're going to new highs this year or something like that. Very, very few and far between. Most are very cautious or bearish on the market, okay? And then, you know, I thought this was absolutely amazing. I'm so happy he did this. I'm so happy somebody in the private stock group shared this in the chat. Meet Kevin did a post on Twitter and he said, so did the stock market bottom in June or is this just a bear market rally? And look at this. 57% of people said, no, this is just a bear market rally. We're going to go lower than we were back in June, right? That is intriguing, very intriguing. So here we are at a moment where retail believes, oh, it's just a bear market rally. Most people on Wall Street believe this is just a bear market rally, right? And everybody's so convinced this is just a bear market rally. And um, it's just, it's interesting because you don't usually see that dynamic when the NASDAQ makes that sort of move. You usually see people going very, very bullish, and it's just not the vibes of the stock market right now, which I think is very, very interesting because that rarely happens. You look at some of these moves in some of these stocks. STC Smell Direct Club, which basically they sell like those clear liners um, that are kind of like slowly, slowly starting to replace like traditional braces, unless your, your teeth are really messed up, then you need still traditionally bra uh, traditional braces. But look at this stock. It's moved up 111% from those June bottoms. That's an insane move. Look at, let's be honest. 69% in a matter of less than two months in the stock. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary move there. Look at good old Tesla Maesla. 47% from the June bottom. Holy smoke, as I say, no dang jokers. That's an absolutely massive move. But keep this in mind, and this is extremely important for everybody watching this video right now, okay? SDC, for instance, even after that massive move, that stock is still down 19% year to date. 19%. Honest is down almost 47% year to date, even after this massive 69% move or whatever, right? Still down year to date 46%. Tesla Myesla, even after that massive move, 22% down, okay? And so I think this is very important for everybody watching this video. Just remember, yes, these moves have been pretty epic off the bottom, but maybe a lot of these stocks got far, you know, way oversold essentially. And so they still have so far to climb back. And do those stocks ever reach those previous values of this year in this year? And I think that's a big question. Does Tesla get that rest of that 22% back? And I think if you ask most people in the market, I think they would say no, because that's the overall feeling. It's just a bear market rally. We're going to get overextended and then we're going to have to go back down again, right? So I think that's just food for thought that so many of these stocks still have a long way to climb. And if you look at most of these stocks that have come back extremely strong over the past month or two, man, do they have a long way to go before they ever get back to just where they were at this year. I'm not talking about 2021 highs. I'm talking about where to get back to where they started this year. Okay. And so I think that's just some important food for thought there. Okay. Mr. Michael Burry. Okay. So Michael Burry, 
they, they treat this man like he's a god. You can't ever say anything bad about this guy. And, you know, I, I posted, I saw this, uh, you know, I was posting in the Discord chat recently. And, uh, you know, somebody had, had said, you know, RIP to all the tourists and traders who, you know, use voodoo and beads and all this stuff to turn, you know, super bearish on the market in June. And uh, Michael Burry feels like he's got a, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, I guess he's, got, he's always got something to say out there. And it's just interesting because, you know, if you're a short seller, usually the best idea is to kind of keep things as on the DL as possible. And, you know, Burry's like, yo, NASDAQ is, is up 23% off its lows. Congratulations. We now have an average bear market rally. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I think to myself, I wonder, I'm, you know, I see somebody like Burry and I'm like, why does he feel the need to constantly, like, I guess you can say like argue with people on Twitter or like constantly have to like, um, you know, push his agenda. I mean, at his sort of level, you know, I was looking up his net worth. His net worth is supposedly $300 million. And, you know, I'm just like, like, why does he even feel the need to have to publicly like come out and say, oh, you're just, you know, this is just a bear market rally and things like that. When you, when you have that sort of net worth, you know what I mean? Like, I don't even spend my money, uh, my time arguing on Twitter. Like, I'm worth a whole lot less than Michael Burry is. Like, I'm just like, like, is it really worth your time? But sometimes I think certain individuals have almost like chips on their shoulders, right? And sometimes, those chips on their shoulders can come from a situation where you come from a very wealthy family and you inherit lots of money. Is this a situation with Mr. Burry? Well, look at this. Uh, I'll take a moment to tell you guys about today's sponsor of the video, Tendies. Tendies has to be one of the most game-changing services to come in the stock market in some time. You see, we just got a update here on unusual at options activity in the market. So we just got an update there that somebody's doing 408 calls for the SPY here. If you're somebody that's interested in options, I think Tendies is a must for you. With my pinned comment down there, you can access all this information for free. Yes, you heard me right, for free. Other services will charge anywhere from $40 to potentially like $300 dollars a month for the same type of activity that that tendies gives away for free which is pretty darn awesome okay so look at this if we just want to see options activity unusual options activity for calls we can see it all here if we want to know puts we can see it all here let's look at something like tesla okay so you can type in tesla there we can see all the unusual activity for tesla in regards to put options and, and the real time kind of data coming through here we can see calls as well which is absolutely amazing you can also connect your brokerage account they connect to many of the biggest brokers accounts out there so all in one place absolutely amazing make sure you check out pin comment down there you guys will enjoy tendies it's absolutely amazing and uh yeah enjoy all this access for free with the pin comment down there um you know burry started his hedge fund scion capital which was funded by inheritance and loans from his family you know if you come from a family that's loaded cool you know, that's fine. But I feel like people that come from these sorts of families, and there's, oh, there's a lot of it on Wall Street. A lot of these folks on Wall Street, man, a lot of them did not grind from the bottom up. They came from families that were loaded with money, okay? And, you know, they get to start these funds, and they got all these connections to all these super high net worth individuals. And uh, they go to these prestigious universities that are all paid for by their families. And they get these privileges that 99% of us just don't have the privilege for that, right? Um, we didn't come from families with, with, you know, loaded with money. We had to start with minimum wage jobs and, and, you know, try to grind up any way we could, right? And these individuals have this unbelievable just opportunity in front of themselves, but they feel very, they feel like they have a chip on their shoulder, right? Because when you come from that, you're never going to get people's full respect, you're never going to get as, as much respect as somebody that like climbed from the bottom and made it up the ranks, right? And it's like, they came from a rich family. Like they, they got all this money to do this and do that. It's such an unfair advantage. They get all their university paid for or out of pocket from their families to go to whatever colleges they want to go to, right? Any universities they want to go to. And it's like, you know, they got the hookups with all the, the people they need to have hookups with at that university, you know, because their, their family might be giving them money. Like, it's just, it's a, it's a whole system. But, you know, it's one thing if you come from that system. It's another because these guys feel usually like they have a chip on their shoulder. And that's why they have to, you know, come out and, and, and say this and say that, right? And, um, you know, when it comes to Burry, people get very confused around this man. They think he is some stock market god, some great um, short selling, amazing short seller or something like that, okay? When... How did Burry actually make that fortune, right? We are obviously I understand he inherited a bunch of money. He got loans from family as well to start Scion Capital Management. But like, 
How did he actually make all that money? Was he shorting stocks? No, he was not. In 2005, Burry started to focus on subprime market. Through his, uh, through his analysis, the mortgage lending practice in 2003-2004, he correctly predicted the real estate bubble would collapse in early 2007. His research on the values of residential real estate convinced him that the subprime mortgages, especially those with teaser rates in bond based on these mortgages, would begin losing value when the original rates were replaced with much higher rates often in as little as two years after initiation. The conclusion led him to short the housing market by persuading Goldman Sachs and other investment firms to sell him credit default swaps against subprime deals he saw as vulnerable. During his payments uh, toward the uh, credit default swaps, Burry suffered an investor revolt. Some investors in his fund worried about his predictions being inaccurate and demanded to withdraw their capital. Eventually, Burry's analysis proved correct. He, per he made a personal profit of $100 million million dollars and a profit for the remaining investors of more than 700 million. Scion Capital uh, ultimately recorded returns of 489% uh, you know, from basically November through June of 08, which is an incredible return over that eight-year span. The S&P widely you know, uh, regarded as a benchmark for the U.S. market returned just 3%. So Burry got this right, and obviously this is why he's super famous today, right? This is, this is, this is the deal with Burry. Like, this is why he's famous. This is why he's known. This is why if he does anything, you know, all the media covers it, right? Because of this bet he made a long, long time ago. But this was not a stock market bet. Let's be very clear about that. This was a bet on, on credit default swaps. And so I just think it's interesting that now because he made that very successful bet that made him super famous, no people think he's a stock market god. Like, like, oh my gosh, this guy's such a stock market genius. And it's like, well, how did he actually make that fortune? That wasn't, that wasn't shorting a bunch of stocks. How he made that 100 million plus for himself, right? And made all those investors a bunch of money, right? But people automatically think because you're successful at this thing, you're automatically super successful at this thing. And that's not the way this works. It's never been the way this works. You could be super successful at real estate, for instance, and not be good at the stock market. You could be super good at the stock market and not good at real estate. You could be decent at both. You could be bad at both. Like, like you, There's many various factors there, right? But just because somebody made this famous bet doesn't mean they're magically all oh, they're the stock market god. Like this actually had nothing to do with the stock market in reality, right? And so this is kind of food for thought that I think a lot of people don't even like think about, right? And it causes a lot of confusion. And I feel like this has to be cleared up. And when you have these movies that are made, right? Like The Big Short's a very famous movie in the stock market space, like The Wolf of Wall Street, very famous space uh, movie that was made in, in the you know, let's just call it the market space, right? And when these movies are made. You know, they're, they're made by usually a lot of great actors and great directors and things like that. And they, they give these like almost larger than life personas and people kind of fall in love with the characters of the movie, right? They fall in love with Christian Bale in that movie and they fall in love with Leonardo DiCaprio in that movie. And they almost build like this fantasy of that character and how amazing they are because of the way the movie's portrayed. When in reality, um, you might be sadly disappointed because it's a movie. And if you know anything about the movie business, they exaggerate a lot. And uh, they, they make the characters try to be as cool as possible and as likable as possible. And, um, and they, they'll even fabricate situations that happen in those movies that did not really happen just so it gets you feeling an emotional way about that certain individual. And therefore, you always have like a, a special place in your heart for that individual because they were played by this character, right? And it's just a trap like Hollywood sets all the time, but people fall for this. And the problem is, it's like one thing if it's like a, a fictional character that you have no connection to, but when it's a real life character that is still like an ongoing process, right? You almost build this like fascination with this individual that was built upon a movie you saw and you were fed situations that probably never even actually played out like that, but because they played out in a movie like that, you think, oh, they're so cool, they're so almighty, they know so much, right? And, um, you know, it's just kind of like a, a play on emotions, I call it that. It's a play on emotions, and that's what Hollywood's good at, and that's why, you know, movies are good. I like The Big Short, I like The Wolf of Wall Street, I like all those movies, um, you know, but just from the perspective of, like, it's entertainment. I understand there's a lot of things in there. The Social Network's probably one of my favorite movies ever I ever saw. A lot of the social networks complete BS. A lot of those situations did not happen. It wasn't as cool as it was portrayed. And um, that's just the way it is. But it's a Hollywood movie. You've got to exaggerate things. You've got to make it as cool as possible. You've got to get everybody to fall in love with these characters. But then people take that off of that, right? Now, Burry, this came out back in May. The, you know, 
he, he basically loaded up on put options on Apple stock. Okay? Michael Burry's head, on, head of Scion Asset Management just reported a huge short position in a large put option position in Apple stock. Basically, on May 16th, Scion Asset Management reported in a quarterly filing that its put option holding is the largest position it had. That's crazy. The puts represent over 17.86% of total assets reported in the filing. I mean, whoa, uh, whoa, okay. Now, since this news came out in May, what has happened, uh, you know, since this news broke about Apple? Well, Apple has went up 20 percent since that news came out okay this is why i say you know it's almost better to just kind of keep your mouth quiet uh, about these sorts of things because uh yeah the stock's gone absolutely beast mode no i'm not a huge believer in in apple over the next uh, i don't know i should say several quarters but the difference is i'm smart enough to realize i'm not going to bet against apple because apple's freaking apple and they've gotten to a place that they're such an amazing company that it's a very difficult proposition to bet against that sort of company. Even if I feel like there's a chance their stock's going to go down, I still can't. There's a difference between like thinking that might happen and being like, I'm going to bet against the, you know, the greatest company in the world. That's a very tough, very tough uh, proposition there. And especially when that particular company has so many long-term investors in it that are huge believers of Apple's future, right? And you've got people like Warren Buffett that are huge investors in that company, you're basically betting against Warren Buffett. You know, tough. If, if Apple stock goes down in any considerable way, what do you think Berkshire is going to do? Then they're loaded with money. You think they're just going to sit there and not buy? Hmm. I think there's a decent probability they'll be loading up on shares if Apple stock was to fall in any meaningful way. What about Apple itself? Apple itself, we, all, we know they usually have 12 figures plus of cash just sitting around in their balance sheet. If Apple stock falls with big time, they always got these big share buybacks on. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to be buying their stock back as well. What about all the other investors that always want to build out Apple positions as it is? You think if Apple stock goes down a bunch, they're not going to buy? So that's when it makes it difficult to necessarily bet against the stock price. Even if you feel like the business fundamentals are going to deteriorate and maybe net income goes down in the short term, it's a big difference between doing that and buying put options. And the worst part is with put options, you buy a bunch of put options, you're setting yourself up in a, in a time situation, time sensitive. You don't give yourself time for this to play out. It's not like going along a stock and let's say the first year of that stock is just down, down, down. You can just buy more shares for cheaper and you're like, I'm holding this for the next five, 10 years anyways. I don't care. When you buy put options on a stock, if the, the, the options expire in one year and that stock's not moving down a bunch, you're going to lose almost all your capital you put into that. And Scion could potentially lose 17, 18% of their capital they put into that, potentially, right? If Apple stock just keeps moving up and uh, their options all expire worthless and they're like, uh, what happened here? Okay. And so that's something that can play out. And so it's a very, very dangerous bet. And yeah, it looks great as long as, uh, you know, Apple stock tanks or something like that. But this is another reason why short sellers many times will try to come out and scare people because they need, they need people to sell. I'll be honest. And if you've got massive put options out there, you need people to get out ASAP. And if this market keeps moving up, you are screwed because the more Apple stock moves up, even if it falls, even if it falls, it might not get anywhere close to where you need it to get to, to make any sort of real money on that put option play. Okay. And so yeah, that, that's a whole situation there, okay? Now, this is the issue with ever treating uh, any investor, kind of like get, treating them like a godlike figure, okay? And, you know, everybody kind of goes through this at certain times. I remember even at the end of 2020 and into early 2021, people treated me like I was a godlike figure because everything I touched was turned into gold. Everything I was in was going up massively. And obviously, as being somebody that, you know, branded a lot of my content around Tesla stock in 2018, 2019, as that made its run in, you know, 2020 and 2021, like I, I received obviously so much praise and, and people definitely treated me like I was a god. But very quickly, you can go from treating people like they're a god to um, treating them like they're nothing, right? And they know nothing and they're clueless and things like that. And um, the market is very fickle with kind of those sorts of things. And so you, know, you just got to be careful. Like, you know, remember who Michael Burry is. There's a man that started with a bunch of inheritance and family loans to basically start his, his big fund there. He made a bunch of money 
not from the shorting the stocks, but from actually doing these CDOs with like Goldman Sachs and other investment banks. And so this is just very important. And, and people, you know, act like you can't say anything bad about the man. And I'm like, just, you know, let's just, let's just chill a little bit here. Okay. You know, in my opinion, like what's the recommended thing people should do? Always keep 10 to 30% cash down to 10% if you're in a situation where you're investing very heavily, up to 30% if you think the market's overvalued or you think you're, you're having trouble finding good deals out there, build it up to like 30%. If you go over 30% cash, you're probably not working hard enough to find good deals in the market because there's always, there's always something out there in the market. There's thousands of stocks in the market. And trust me, there's always something out there, okay? To have 10 to 15 stocks in your portfolio, dollar cost average those babies. If they go down a ton and you love the business just as much, add those positions and do the GVD one, two, three strategy, which is something I teach about in this video here. That's absolutely free on YouTube. Literally, you can type into YouTube G GVD one, two, three and watch that whole video on that. And that's the best route to go. All this short selling and, and we're going to buy puts and we're going to get in the market. And we're going to get out of the market and all this stuff, man, all it's going to make you do is ultimately lose a fortune over time. Remember, where does the stock market go most years? up. If you own great companies, where are they going to go most of the time? Up. Yeah, you're going to have some downs here and there, and you're going to go through some crashes and things like that. That is part of the process. And when you're in those crashes, always remember, don't sell and you better freaking buy. Okay. And that's the name of the game. We know this throughout history. Unfortunately, people fall for the opposite stuff all the time. And then they try to start shorting. Then they start trying to do day trading. Then they start doing this and that. And then they're completely lost and they give up on the stock market. Don't fall into that crowd, guys. Much love as always. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I appreciate you joining me and uh, have a great day.